Chino and Michelle Pfeiffer as lovers in Frankie and Johnny. Jodie Foster is mom to a genius in Little Man Tate. And Tom Berenger doesn't know who to trust in Shattered. Don't start writing me notes. Al Pacino and Michelle Pfeiffer in Frankie and Johnny, the new film from the director of Pretty Woman and one of five new movies we'll be reviewing this week on Siskel and Ebert. I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. And I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. Our first movie is an offbeat love story named Frankie and Johnny about lonely people who live closed off lives in the big city. Frankie, played by Michelle Pfeiffer, is a waitress in a Greek restaurant, and Johnny, played by Al Pacino, is an ex-convict who goes to work there as a short order cook. These eggs don't look runny. Mr. DeLeon likes them runny. They look runny to me. They're pretty runny. He's a regular. Who can argue with that? And who can argue with you? Thy head is full of quarrel, like an egg is full of meat. William Shakespeare, Romeo and Juliet. I'm reading it now. The director, Gary Marshall, wants to place these characters in a setting of other lonely people, including Jane Morris as a waitress who's a loner, and Kate Nelligan as one who's a cynic. Yes, Helen's still out. <sighs> Nick thinks she'll be back tomorrow. Good. You know what your problem is? You're too picky. <gasps> women like that always have opinions about women like us. Frankie resists Johnny's advances as long as she can, but one night, some truth gets told. We fit like peas in a pod, like a rock and a key. I'm not so sure I like where your key's been. I like the performances in this movie, the way Pacino and Pfeiffer give their characters little spins of eccentricity and humanity. But one of the problems with Hollywood is that it persists in using stars in roles that don't really fit the stars. Frankie and Johnny is based on a play by Terrence McNally about a plain and plump and isolated woman, played by Kathy Bates on Broadway. Michelle Pfeiffer is a wonderful actress. She's good in this movie, but she is also a beautiful woman, and Al Pacino is a great-looking guy, and the fact that these two people could be attracted to one another is not necessarily terrific news for all the other lonely and unpopular people in the world. I felt there was a, a kind of a bottom line of implausibility to this casting. And so you're voting thumbs down? Yes. Okay, I'm I'm voting thumbs up, and you know, uh, I uh, I like the picture for the things that you mentioned. Um, what Gary Marshall does, in addition to these two characters, there are a number of sequences scattered all throughout the picture, montages of people huddling up at night together or sleeping alone, and those sequences, which, you know, he came up with, really do, I think, sell the story, and I think that of the two people, I think that Pfeiffer does a real good job of uh, not, I don't think it's just a question of her not understanding why he doesn't, he's coming on to her. I think she knows. that. I think this woman has been hit on countless times in her life. And I think I, I bought her, her great looks and all, I bought her as uh, a victimized, uh, fed-up woman. And so I liked it. The only part that I didn't like is I, th I didn't buy Pacino in the character. I thought he's got a one-note character. Uh, trying to turn her on and, uh, you know, and come on, lighten up and all that. And I didn't, I didn't buy his, him at all. A lot of his dialogue read very much as if it were written. Absolutely. I mean, we know that as an ex-con, he spent a lot of time in prison reading, and now he quotes everything that he read. read a lot of And that is more of a, of a playwright or a screenwriter's conceit, I think, than it is what a real person would that's, do. That's the problem I had. But with. another problem I have with the film is that a lot of it is just kind of slow. I felt that her character unfolded, and, and as you said, later there is pain revealed, and that's where I thought the drama was. I'm, I'm recommending it with the provision of, of the Pacino, I think, is a bad character. Okay. Our next movie...
movie is named Homicide. This is a terrific film, the disturbing new psychological drama from writer-director David Mamet. This is his third feature coming on top of his great career, of course, in the theater, and it's a most absorbing, disturbing, entertaining film telling the story of a smart Jewish detective who suffers an identity crisis when he tries to solve the murder of an elderly Jewish woman shopkeeper. The fine actor Joe Mantegna, a David Mamet regular, plays the detective Bobby Gold. William H. Macy plays his admiring partner. How come you always got to be the first one through the door? So brazen. Bobby Gold's main skill, in addition to his bravery, is his ability to talk. Here he tries to get the mother of a cop killer to help bring her son to justice before he's killed on the streets. It's a scene designed to link the suffering of black Americans with that of Jews worldwide. Who's a garbage man? You think I don't know that? I know that. Looking for something to love. You got something to love. You got your boys. That's something. Look in my eyes. I want to save your son. Hey, not my people, baby. So much anti-Semitism last 4,000 years, we must be doing something to bring it about. When Bobby goes to the home of the murdered old woman, he reveals himself as a self-hating Jew, feeling somehow responsible and embarrassed by the millennia of Jewish suffering. You're a Jew and you talk that way in the house of the dead. Do you have any shame? I'm sorry about your grandmother. No one asked you to be sorry. No one asked for your sympathy. We would have appreciated your respect. Do you hate yourself that much? Do you belong nowhere? Tracking the murderer leads Bobby to the back room of a Jew-hating store owner. Suddenly, Bobby can no longer deny his heritage. Homicide works well in so many ways. On the simplest level, it's actually two thrillers, the search for the cop killer and the search for the killer of the old lady. And then, of course, there's Bobby's search within himself for what it means to be a Jew, never divorced from hate. He is strong, he's heroic, and what is rare about this character in the movies is that for all of the hundreds of Jewish people who work in the American movie industry, they have rarely produced films with vital Jewish people. Bobby Gold is brave, and he conquers his shame, and he still reaches out to others in pain. His story is sad and scary and thrilling, too. Obviously, I like Homicide a lot. I liked it a lot, too, and one, two, three, with these three pictures that David Mamet has made, he mm -hmm. has established himself as a very special American film director. I mean, we know about his achievements on the stage. Right. This is also an House area. of Games and Things Change are the other two pictures yeah, for and now comes this one. And there is dialogue in this film. He's famous for his dialogue. He's famous for his use of four-letter words and so forth. We expect that. But it's almost musical. It's almost like jazz. There are riffs of dialogue here. And the way these cops talk to each other, it is not done as a stunt. You, you are aware both that it has a realistic base and that it's been elevated into a style. And in the screening that I've seen it twice, I saw it at the Cannes Film Festival, I saw it again yeah. yesterday, both screenings, people laughed in appreciation of, of, how, of how great it was to listen yeah. to this smart fast dialogue. Now you're talking about the picture as if it's a fast-paced thriller and it is that. But it's I, also what you talked it, about. It too. is absolutely yes. a, an important psychological study mm -hmm. of a guy who is getting connected to his roots and it, it's very good. I want to also tell you there's one thing that surprised me. There's a, there's a point in the, in the movie where this character remembers something. He has an appointment late in the picture. Yeah. It's involved a, a case. I was so absorbed in his personal story. Uh -huh. Like him, I forgot about the other case. Did that happen? <laughs> did, did you? You get, you get involved in his real time. Exactly. Uh, for example, the whole business of getting to the one uh, stick-up murder while he's on his way to another one. And he keeps yes. saying, I'm not here. You didn't see me. This isn't my case. This isn't my That's case. That's very good plotting. And he really wanted to be in the other place. Yes. And then tell him it already came down, Bobby. Yeah, it's well done. Good stuff. Coming up next, Jody Foster's directing debut no. in Little Man Tate. No. If you think you're going to make me say things like choo-choo and big garage to get you to open up your mouth, you got another thing coming. But if we just say, uh, see you tomorrow, just that a goodbye, huh? If you send me the checkbook, I'll balance it for you. I think I can take care of that, Freddie.
That's Jody Foster. There is a mother of a bright little boy. She is 28 years old herself and has already been appearing in the movies for 25 years. And on the basis of her own first film as a director, Jody Foster was apparently able to learn a lot on the job. Little Man Tate stars Foster as a single mom of an incredibly bright little boy. And even when he's two years old, he's already a prodigy. Coffer, mommy. No, Fred. That's a plate, Fred. No coffer. Okay? Coffer. Look. Right? No coffer. It's a plate. Jesus. One of the things I like about the movie is that the kid may be a genius, but he's sort of lacking in social skills. Fred Tate? Fred Tate! <laughs> Diane Weiss plays the child psychologist who wants to recruit the little man for her school for child geniuses. What I'm trying to tell you, Miss Tate, is that right now your son is starving for stimulation and challenge and for some order in his life. Things that you don't provide, but that I will. In his new world, Fred Tate meets and out thinks other bright kids, including P.J. Auckland, as an obnoxious math whiz. Somebody, for God's sake, challenge me. Okay. How about giving me a number that when divided by the product of its digits, the quotient is three, and if you were to add 18 to this number, the digits would be inverted. That is correct, David. And the character of that older kid there who bills himself as a math magician is one of the real treasures in this movie. This is a completely original film with a lot of off-the-wall humor in it, and some of the best scenes involve the weird relationships between all of the students at that school for geniuses. Diane Weiss creates a really original character in The Child Psychologist who doesn't exactly relate to the kids at all. She doesn't talk to them. She dictates to them like their telephone answering machines. Adam Hanbert is a complete movie original, bright and gifted, but also a little kid who needs his mom and doesn't quite understand the world that he's in. And I like the way Foster's character refused to let herself be bulldozered by the child experts. This is her kid, and she knows him best. Little Man Tate is a warm and funny movie, and it has a little sadness in it, too. I Gee, liked it. You keep calling it original, and I don't think that it, it's that original in this sense. I think it plays right into all the standard stereotypes that a smart kid, a precocious kid, is naturally socially retarded. I think that uh, that's the standard, that's a stock character. I think that the person who runs a school for gifted children uh, doesn't really know how to relate to children is another stock character and is insensitive and that the other kids are quirky and bratty. I mean, it, the kid is funny with the, the math and magician. That's funny. What I, what I did like about the picture, first of all, I think her directing is just fine. What I did like about the picture is Foster's relationship with her kid. As we watch it, it's very easy to read that as her replaying possibly what her relationship with her own mother, because she was obviously tremendously gifted, too. And there's some real warm contact. But, Gene, but the whole story is so standard. You, it's very unfair of you to say that either the kid or Diane Weiss' character are not original just because you have seen maybe other movies like that. I can't think of any right now because these two actors create completely original people in the roles. Diane Weist plays a character that you have never seen in a movie before and so uh, does Ron, uh, no. Adam Hanbert. You have not Ron, seen these people Roger, before no, no, and the no. fact that their characters fit into some guidelines that you may have heard about isn't really a criticism. No. I would, I would tell you, the Roger, in, the, in the, the standard portrait, you read all these articles about schools for gifted children, and every journalist takes the same tack. You would, too, and so would I, which is that they're... Maybe they're all right. Maybe they're, they're correct. I'm just calling it a stereotype. No surprises. Coming up next, Oscar winner Denzel Washington stars in the thriller Ricochet about another brave cop who's under attack. Now, in time it takes you to pump it one time, I'll have three bullets in your head, maybe one in your chest. I'll be on my way back to the station doing paperwork and eating donuts. From hot wiring Corvettes to hot wiring cocaine, I'm impressed. That's Denzel Washington, of course, the Oscar winner from Glory, in the new movie Ricochet, playing a rookie cop who becomes famous overnight when his heroics are captured by an amateur video camera and telecast on the news. I'll drop the gun, but here's the deal. I lay the gun down, you let the girl go, I'll be your hostage. All right? Drop the gun! All right, nice and easy. I'm putting the gun down. Nice and easy. Nice and easy. 
Nobody gets hurt. Now, the only weapon I got left now is useless unless you're a pretty girl. That's John Lithgow as the killer who was captured and sent to prison. Some of the dialogue in Ricochet is very smart as Washington immediately gets a promotion from the district attorney, Lindsey Wagner. Oh, don't put your uniform back on. You took it off for the psychopath. Keep it off for me. I don't want you wearing anything from this point on except civvies. You and your partner have both been promoted to detective by Chief Floyd. Congratulations. Seven years later, John Lithgow escapes and carries on a movie-long campaign to humiliate Denzel Washington. But first, time out for a ridiculous arm wrestling match. This is no fun. That's better. Later in the film, in a much better scene, Denzel Washington pretends to be suicidal in order to lure Lithgow out of hiding. Lithgow doesn't want the suicide to happen. He wants Washington to suffer more. No. For all of its stylishness, Ricochet regularly undoes itself with highly improbable scenes. Think about what you just saw. Why wouldn't John Lithgow's character be satisfied with Denzel Washington committing suicide? That's victory enough, but no. This supposedly is gonna lure him out of hiding so he can keep the guy alive to insult him more? What more would he want except the guy to commit suicide? So a mixed review from me, because for every goofy scene in Ricochet, there's one that does work in this ambitiously directed film by a music video director, Russell Mulcahy. He just needs to tighten up his story sense. I can't believe that you like that scene where Denzel Washington is standing on top of the building that you pointed out there is one of the better scenes in the movie. I thought it was embarrassing. And I thought there's a scene right before that where Denzel Washington is so emotionally distraught that he can't get a sentence out and he starts you know, blathering incomplete no. sentence fragments uh, that was embarrassing too. Somebody should have had mercy on this poor actor who was asked to do this. And as for that, the, the basic plot, which is the innocent man who's framed, is right out of Hitchcock and could have been a good film, but the way they do it with things involving child pornography and putting children in danger and uh, ac accusations of sexual perversion and fake porno tapes and so forth. It's just so unsavory and so distasteful. And, and perhaps in a significant film, I wouldn't object to it, but this film is as light as a feather. Well, so why deal in this ugly uh, stuff? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very violent, and I suppose I should point that out. But um, I'm not giving it a positive review, just mixed. When we come back, Shattered with Greta Skaki and Tom Berenger. Do you really think you're ready for this? Don't you think I am? Feel too much of the plot for fear of giving away an important secret. Shattered is the kind of movie where, in a way, you can't say anything without giving away an important secret because the whole movie is based upon a development that is indeed shattering and also preposterous, unbelievable, and kind of silly. The movie stars Tom Berenger as a man who's been nearly killed in a car crash and has amnesia as a result. He can't remember much of his personal life, including Greta Skaki, who is apparently his wife, and sometimes his frustrations in this film turn to anger. Bob Hoskins co-stars in the movie as a private eye who's retired to run a pet store, but still can't let go of this particular case. Don't you find it a little odd that on the same day you gave me those pictures, my wife and I had a terrible accident. She gets thrown out with hardly a scratch. I wind up looking like hamburger. Then there's the mystery of the red sports car and a driver who seems to want to kill them. After we reviewed Dead again not long ago, I got a couple of notes from people who complained that the movie was just plain too preposterous. Well, they haven't seen anything until they've seen Shattered. The movie's basic premise is completely unbelievable, and so are a couple of other elements, including the explanation, Gene, of why Bob Hoskins is still alive at oh, the end. That good. was a classic. I guess I wouldn't even mind the plot so much if the movie made us really care about someone, but it's so busy playing switcheroos that we end up more puzzled than involved. Well, uh, for a while there, I was trying to outguess the picture, yeah. and then when uh, it resolves itself, you feel like you weren't really being played fair with, and that's, that's, the yeah. that's a big problem. You should have some inkling of what's going on, and it's very hard to, to uh, come up with this one. Um, <clears throat> that's really, that, that's all the picture's about. It's simple game. You know, what's really going on? Who's tricking this guy? Mm -hmm. And um, and that's it. You find out the answer. Like They could have handed you that in an envelope uh, yeah. for all the, the impact it has. Another little, just one little 
tiny yeah. loose end. Not only didn't I believe how Bob Hoskins That's ridiculous. saved himself, but how did he then get his arm bandaged, get into a helicopter, oh. and arrive at the next scene within the next five minutes? Well, it's time for the movie to end. Everyone's got to get in shape. That's right. Coming up next, our video pick of the week, one of Al Pacino's best performances, much better than his work in Frankie and Johnny. My review of Frankie and Johnny at the top of this show, I felt Al Pacino was playing down to his working class character in that film, but that wasn't true back in 1973 when Pacino lit up the screen in Sidney Lumet's Serpico, playing an honest street cop blowing the whistle on a corrupt New York police department. I'm sure there is a young generation of moviegoers who have never seen Serpico. This recommendation is for them. Now let's recap the movies we reviewed on this show. A split vote on Frankie and Johnny. Roger didn't like the glamorous casting, but I was touched by the performance of Michelle Pfeiffer. Two thumbs up, way up, for David Mamet's Homicide, a terrific thriller and a fine portrait of a man reconnecting with his heritage. A split vote on Jodie Foster's Little Man Tate. Roger thought the child prodigy film was original. I think it's filled with stock characters. Two thumbs down for Ricochet, the cop thriller with Denzel Washington that I like a little bit more than Roger. And two more thumbs down for the gimmicky thriller Shattered. So Homicide is the picture we really like. And Joe Mantegna, we haven't mentioned him enough, he gets an I'd love to see him get an Academy Award nomination. That'd be great. That's it for this week. Next week we'll be back with reviews of new movies, including one starring Danny DeVito, who wants to make a lot of other people's money. And we'll also review John Sayles' new movie about urban corruption, City of Hope. That's next week, and until then, the balcony is closed. Flash finish from Jonelle. Dries nail polish in less than a minute as it hardens nail enamel to reduce chipping and cracking. Flash finish from Jonelle. New, exciting Major League Baseball raisins from All American Raisins. Check out your local team, the healthy pro sports snack for all occasions. For that special time in your child's life, bring home Walt Disney's cartoon classics, Disney videos, for your child's magic years. The natural manicure from Jonelle. It's quick and easy. No more worries about changing your nail color to match every outfit. From Jonelle.